Hello everyone. Um, let me begin by apologizing for the slight delay in, in uh, beginning this uh, event, a slight technical hitch. I want to welcome you uh, to this online event brought to you by the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at uh, UCLA. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair of Israel Studies at UCLA. And it's my uh, great pleasure to be hosting this event and introducing our speakers today. Uh, the event entitled Love in the Time of Corona, a look at Jewish mythology and Israeli literature. This event is being live streamed on YouTube and on the Nazarian Center's website, or at least I hope it is. Uh, let me begin by thanking our co-sponsors, the UCLA Department of English, the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures, the Center of Near East, for Near Eastern Studies, and the Center for the Study of Religion. I also want to thank our promotional partners, the Jewish Book Council and Diesel, a bookstore in Brentwood, California. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our featured guest, celebrated Israeli writer, Ayelet Bundar Goshen, a clinical psychologist and award-winning author. Her first novel, One Night Markovich, won the Sapir Prize in 2012, which is one of Israel's highest literary honors. Um, and it's also won multiple international awards and was translated into 14 languages. Her second novel, Waking Lions, won the 2017 Jewish Quarterly Wingate Prize, which is a prestigious British literary prize for Jewish literature. It was also the New York Times Book Review's pick for Editor's Choice, and the Wall Street Journal selected it as one of its best summer reads. And her critically acclaimed third novel, The Liar, which came out in English, last year, last fall, was picked by Elle magazine as 2019 best book of the year. Uh, so she has been uh, won major accolades around the world. In addition to her uh, phenomenal literary output, uh, Ayala Gundar Goshen has also contributed to the BBC's The Cultural Frontline. She's written for the Financial Times, Time Magazine and The Telegraph. Um, she's lectured at UCLA, a great accomplishment, to be sure, um, as well as at UC Berkeley and other institutions like Columbia University. She's written screenplays for TV and cinema. She holds a master's degree in psychology from Tel Aviv University um, and studied screenwriting at the Sam Spiegel Film School in Jerusalem. After we hear from Ayelet, she will be joined for a conversation by our second speaker, Jonathan Kirsch, who is also very accomplished in his own right. He is the best-selling author of 13 books, uh, the book editor of the Jewish Journal, a uh, book reviewer for the Washington Post, and a publishing attorney, uh, attorney on top of that. Uh, he's also served as an adjunct professor at NYU's Professional Publishing Institute. He's written books about the Bible as literature, books about Judaism and the history of religion, as well as several novels and books about law. And his books include the national bestseller, The Harlot by the Side of the Road, and another popular book, A History of the End of the World. Uh, before we begin, uh, I'd just like to encourage you to send in your questions. We will be taking questions later in the program. If you want to ask a question, uh, use the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, but if you're listening on live stream, you can always email your questions to us at israel at international.ucla.edu. That's israel at international.ucla.edu. And we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. So, without further ado, let me now hand it over to our featured speaker, Ayelet Gunda Goshen. Thank you. Uh, so, shalom uh, to everyone and uh, happy Shavuot holiday. Uh, I would like to first thank uh, Professor Dov Waxman and Marna Resnik from UCLA for inviting me. And I'd also like to thank Jonathan Kirsch for joining me, in, to all of you, for joining us today to this talk about um, Israeli literature. Jewish uh, mythology, Jewish tradition, and about love. Um, so a few months ago, if somebody told me that I would be sitting in my house in Tel Aviv, having a talk about literature with people based in the US, I would say that this is impossible. Um, but many things that sounded quite impossible a few months ago suddenly look possible because life sort of surprised us with coronavirus. And when life surprises us, one of the things that we do in order to cope is to dive into literature, to dive into a novel. So someone can hide inside of a novel. We can hide inside of a novel or seek refuge inside of literature from the external world. And sometimes a novel can be like the teddy bear 
that my little boy is holding right now when he went to sleep here in Tel Aviv. He's holding the teddy bear as a shield against the darkness. And I think sometimes grown-ups hold on to books. We hold on to literature. We hold on to our mythology as a sort of shield against the darkness. So sometimes we go into literature as a getaway. We want to get away into, from the thoughts in our head. But sometimes we turn to literature not as a getaway, but as a quest as part of our search for meaning. So we turn to literature in our quest for meaning because we try to understand the world around us, because we try to ask, what is the meaning of what we're going through right now? And Viktor Frankl, the, the Holocaust survivor, suggests that our ability to handle, to, to face catastrophes in our lives, and this could be national catastrophes, worldwide catastrophes, or, or our own private crises, the disability is dependent in the extent that we can find meaning to our suffering. And Frankel quotes Nietzsche when he says, those who have a why to live for can bear with almost any how. And so in the time given to me today, I would like to look into together with you into the different meanings that literature finds in times like this, in times of crisis. And I will start by saying that literature actually likes catastrophes. While most of us do whatever it is that we can to avoid conflict or to avoid catastrophes, literature evokes into life when things start to go wrong. And Stefan Zweig, when he writes about Marie Antoinette, he says it this way. He says, it is only when a man is faced with a catastrophe that his real character is revealed. He says, just as we can only check the quality of a metal when we put it into fire, because only when you put a metal into fire, you can test what it's really made of. So is men, the catastrophe, the plague, it takes off the masks from our faces. It shows our real characters. It shows us for what we really are. So you could say that coronavirus forces us to put a mask on our face, but at the same time, it also takes off the mask from our faces. Because only when somebody is facing a moral challenge, we can say something about his moral quality. Take, for instance, this picture of Magritte, the lovers. So if you look at this picture, we, we see two lovers in a very intimate pose. And I think many of us can spend our entire life with someone thinking that we know him, being in a very close and intimate relationship with him. But at the same time, we're veiled, we're covered. And catastrophes tend to take off the mask, to take off the veil, from our faces. And then in the moment of choice, we can see if a person is really there for us or not in the moment of crisis. For instance, my father told my mother every day how much he loves her. But it was only after my mother got cancer that we actually saw how much he loves her. He could say it in every day of their life together, but the words meant less than the last few months since she was diagnosed with the illness because then there were decisions to be made, there were choices to be made. Or think, for instance, about the priest in Italy who gave up his medical ventilator uh, to give it to a younger patient. I don't know if you heard about it. I think it got a big cover because, you know, a priest can talk for 70 years about love and about grace and about sacrifice. But it is this one moment of choice that tells us how much is this specific priest truly committed to this love and sacrifice that he's talking about. So it's a moment of choice that tells us more than the entire words that somebody speaks in his entire life because it's in moments of crisis that people turn to their priests or to their presidents or to their prime ministers and we see them unmasked. We see their choices, not their words. Just as Jean-Paul Sartre says when he says, we are the sum of our choices, not the sum of our words. And a plague is a moment that requires choices and acts in literature, just like in everyday life. So I would like to suggest that every novel, fiction, or myth about the plague is actually dealing with the question of human responsibility. So when we talk about a plague, and it could be Albert Camus or José Saramago in blindness, but it could also be Zombieland or The Walking Dead. So whenever we talk about a plague, we're always asking the same question. And the question is, when the world falls apart, are we wolves or are we humans? So 
In Sato's play, No Exit, which is a good title for these days, I think, No Exit, he puts three dead characters, they're locked up in a room in hell, and they're waiting to be tortured. They're sure that the torture instruments are just about to enter the room, but they gradually understand during the play that no torture instruments are going to be used because being put in lockdown, being in quarantine together is hell. This is the torture, being stuck together. And so Sartre says, hell is other people. But now let's contradict this notion of Sartre, what is hell, with this Jewish tale about the spoons in the afterworld. So the Jewish tale about the spoons in the afterworld, it shows us hell. And in hell, people are sitting across this big tables covered with really delicious food. But the spoons in their hands are so big, are so enormous that it's impossible to pick up the food and put it in one's mouth. The spoons are just too big for that. And so they're starving. And paradise, heaven, heaven is exactly the same, just that the people are feeding each other with the spoons. The spoons are big, but people are feeding each other with them. And I think this beautiful tale shows us that whenever we're facing a restriction, a restriction could be you can only eat with enormous spoons, but a restriction could also be um, you cannot leave your house for more than 100 feet. A restriction could be you have to be self-isolating for now. Whenever we're faced with a restriction, we think it's the restriction that turns our life into a living hell. But perhaps these Jewish tales offer us the, the, the way of thinking that it's not the restriction that makes us miserable. It's the way we're dealing with the restriction. Are we dealing with it by ourselves or are we doing it together? So when the entire world is sent into lockdown, sent into self-isolation, we're facing the question again, is hell really other people as Salto poses it? Or is lack of other people hell? Because in Israel, I think just like in America, people were put under quarantine because other people were considered a threat. But we soon learned that loneliness is a threat as well. My, my grandmother, She's an 86-year-old woman who celebrated this year Lela Sedel alone in her house for the first time in, in 86 years that she's doing it alone. And she told us, we, we called her and she told us on the phone that loneliness for her is far more traumatizing and far more scarier than coronavirus because people are a, a threat to her, they're a danger, but people are also what she needs the most. And I think this leads us to the deep psychological conflict between distance and closeness. And that's a conflict that is far beyond coronavirus. That's because distance protects us, not only from the virus. It, it protects us from all forms of pain that people can cause other people. When we're alone, no one can hurt us. I'm, I'm a psychologist, so I heard quite often this sentence of people saying, I'd rather be alone than to experience the pain and the agony that other people are causing me. But from the other way around, closeness gives us meaning, it gives us joy, it gives us playfulness. So when my grandmother tells me I'd rather meet the grandkids and risk myself with the virus than to stay alone, she's actually saying I'd rather be infected than be untouched or unloved. And Amos Oz relates to that in his beautiful, beautiful novel, A Tale of Love and Darkness. Part of this novel is set in Jerusalem under siege. So the siege of Jerusalem took part in 1948, started actually in 47, but it took part during the world of independence. And I think what's so beautiful about Amos Oz's book is this mixture between the national and the private, between what the interior and the exterior, because the entire city is under siege, but the boy, Amos Oz, the young Amos Oz, is far less concerned about the city than he is about his family and what's going on with his mother right now. The emotional siege that his depressive mother is going through is far harder than any external siege put by the Arabs. Because to be locked in your house might sound like a curse, but it could also be an opportunity. You're locked in, but in a way, you're locked in, but you open up. You open up to your family, you open up to the people you love. And I think many in Israel, from my grandparents' generation, 
Remember the period of the siege in Jerusalem as a period of togetherness. I remember as a child, I was shocked by that because we heard all the stories about how they only could eat. They picked up leaves and tried to make food from leaves because they didn't have supplies. And I said, you ate from bushes. How could it be a good time? But for them, you know, they had nothing to eat, but they had each other. But if you can't do that, like the depressive mother in Oz's book, so she's self-isolating inside her own mind. The city is under siege. Everybody's opening up to each other. Everybody's in this togetherness together. But she can't be part of that. And in this situation, the entire soul is under siege. It's like the entire soul is under isolation. And that's more dreadful, far more dreadful than any plague or any external threat. And moving from the siege on Jerusalem to, to today, people in Israel talk today about coronavirus as a catastrophe, which it is, of course. But people also say that it had a big contribution to their family life. People, some people say that being locked up together was the best thing that happened to them. But at the same time, the rising ratios of domestic violence show us that what is could be heaven to one person could be held to another person, just like the tale, the Jewish tale of the spoons. And during this long time of quarantine here in, in Tel Aviv, I, I found myself thinking about the first quarantine, about the biblical quarantine. And I'm, I'm obviously talking about the Ark of Noah, the Ivat Noah, which is uh, like a capsule of life in a sea of death. And Noah is on this Ark for 40 days and 40 nights in quarantine. And actually, the word quarantine comes from the word quarenta, 40. In Renaissance, boats that came to Venetia, that came to Italy, from areas which were infected by the plague, were asked to wait for 40 days, quarantine, before they're allowed to come to short. And Noach waits for 40 days, too. Now, the catastrophe that Noach is facing, the flood, it's not a plague, it's the flood. But just like the plague, the flood is also a catastrophe that reveals the true characters of all, the true nature of all the characters involved in the story. So coming back to the question of responsibility, remember I said that a plague or a flood is always about human responsibility. It's not about nature. It's about humans and what we do to one another. So coming back to human responsibility, Noah is a leader that takes responsibility. Human responsibility, not only for him and his household, but to the entire living creatures. He doesn't wait. He doesn't waste time. He doesn't argue with other leaders whose fault it is, like some leaders do today. He takes the responsibility. We do have other minor characters in the story that don't take responsibility. Take, for instance, the raven. So Noah asks the raven to go out and see if the water came down. But the raven refuses to leave the boat. He doesn't want to leave the food and the security. And, and that's a choice. That's a choice not to risk yourself to, to help the others. It's, it's an existential choice. Now, we talked earlier about this psychological conflict between closeness and distance. But in Noah's boat, distance or social distance was never an option. I mean, think about this boat. In Noah's boat, the answer, in the, this whole Jewish tale, the answer to catastrophe is pairs. Noah is asked by God to bring the animals into the boat in pairs. Now, from a biological perspective, from a clear biological perspective, the reason is for them to be able to mate after the flood. But, you know, mythology is never just about the clear biological perspective. It always tries to tell something deeper. And I think what it tries to tell us is, if you ask how can one survive a catastrophe? How can one survive a crisis in pairs together? So a connection of two souls is crucial for dealing with the uncertainty of the outside world. And I think that's a very humanistic, a bit romantic notion about love and family and, and its importance that the Bible is giving us here. And that the exact opposite of what Sartre is saying in No Exit, because he says hell is other people. And I think in Noach's boat, they're saying other people is not hell, other people is the answer to hell. And there's another optimistic thing about the flood, which is even though we're dealing with a disaster, we're dealing with a disaster that has a reason. It didn't just happen out of nowhere. And I think part of what made the current 
outbreak so dramatic was the feeling of shock, of helplessness. Some of my patients told me, we, we thought we were in control of our lives, and then the virus came out of nowhere, just like that. And in the Bible, nothing comes out of nowhere. God brought the flood as a response to sin. So just like he brought the 10 plagues of Egypt as a punishment for Pharaoh for refusing to end up slavery and, and let the, the people of Israel go. So in the Bible, a plague almost never comes without a sin. We have one exception. This is Job. We're not going to talk about him today, maybe later. But I think rather than this case, it never comes without a reason, which is exactly the opposite from Albert Camus' plague. Because in Albert Camus' plague, Camille confronts us with the absurdity of our existence. The plague comes from nowhere. It's absurd, it's a chaos. And in the Bible, there's no absurd and there's no chaos. There is a reason. And as much as the biblical catastrophe is frightening and intimidating for us, it is still a part of divine order. Because I think far more scary than a catastrophe is the thought about a world where catastrophes simply happen for no reason at all. I'm, I'm thinking about the people who joined us today, and I don't know if some of you experienced this, the experience of something that just happening for no reason, and you suddenly feel so small and so helpless. And then the flood, it comes out as a reaction to a sin, just like Sodom and Amorah, Sodom and Gomorrah, are ruined for the sins of her, their inhabitants. And this implies something different. It says that catastrophes don't simply happen. If it's a response to sin, it means that without sin, there's no catastrophe. Now, I'm, I'm a secular Jew. So for me, it was fascinating to see how secular thought can handle the current crisis. It was really interesting to see that since the outbreak of the virus, our consciousness was very used to this equation of catastrophe is a punishment, is trying to figure out, okay, a, a punishment for what? Could it be a punishment for the scientific revolution? Because man tried to be like God, we build this huge cellular antennas, this G5, and they caused the virus. It's, it's a biblical, it's a magic way of looking at the world, right? Could it be a punishment for what we chose to eat? We, we keep t talking in Israel about how people in China ate bats. It's a sort of, you didn't eat kosher, and now look what happened. Or, or could it be a punishment for ecological imprints, or, or could it be a punishment for our hybris and for, in, in a way, our pride, for believing for one moment that the civilization we've built is strong enough to handle the, the huffs and the puffs of the big bad fate. So it might sound strange at the beginning, but I think there's something very assuring thinking about the plague in terms of punishment and sin. It gives us a sort of promise that if we won't commit a sin again, we might be safe. We don't feel helpless. We feel like active agents of change. Now, Camille's comfort in the plague, in his novel, is completely different because he's saying, no, no, the plague is an absurd. Chaos is, is there. There is no meaning to the plague. But we are all facing the decision of how are we going to act in face of this chaos. And, and when it comes to this interest of us in, in disasters or in chaos, this news addiction that we all have, it also has, it also has its, its biblical roots in it. Because if you think about the wife of Lot escaping Sodom, so she's supposed to run away from disaster as fast as she can. But she has this fear of missing out, right? She has FOMO. She doesn't want to miss out. And she turns her head, even though she was told not to, because she wants to look at the death ratios. She wants to know what's going on. And I think many of us here in Israel right now really developed a, a news addiction. We want to, we currently look in our cell phone for the death ratios. And it is, I think, almost as if we want to be witnesses of the catastrophe. We want to witness the disaster. You could say it's to, in order to understand something about ourselves or, or to get a sort of control over the situations. But you could also say that a sort of dark curiosity 
a dark motivation that we have to, to look at the suffering of others, just like people sometimes slow down when they see a car accident. And this one, another, the wife of Lot is heavily punished for her choice to, to look at the suffering of others. She's turned into a, a statue made of soul. She's paralyzed for, forever. And I think many of us today are in a way paralyzed by this news addiction that we have. But coming back to the story of the plague, of the flood, I, I think when you look at the end of the flood, of the tale, so God gives us this promise to never bring flood upon the earth again, which is a promise that we we'll all be very happy to get right now about the pandemic. But if you ask people, how does the story end? Many people would say it ends with the dove. I think many people don't remember the godly promise as much as they remember the image of the dove. So let's talk about the dove. So we said, Noach first asked the raven, to go out and see if the water came down. But the raven refused to fly because he was selfish or simply because he was scared. He, he let fear control him. He stick to what he knows, he stick to familiar. And then Noach asks the dove and the dove accepts. He takes the responsibility. She flies away from the boat. She leaves the safe place, even though it's easier and much safer to stay in the boat. And she returns. And the first time she returns, with nothing. But then she leaves again. The second time she comes back with a leaf of an olive tree, not the fruit, just the leaf. And I think it's very interesting, the decision not to bring the fruit of the olive, but just the leaf, because the leaf is the potential. It's a potential for fruit. It's a potential for happiness. And I think that's the reason why ever since the dove is a symbol of hope, because it's saying, what does a man need in order to survive a catastrophe? We don't just need the physical boat. We need the hope. We need the hope that somewhere along the way, there is a piece of land, a piece of dry land and an olive tree. And it's not an easy path. We don't know how long Noah will have to sail and to search before he reaches the olive tree. We don't even know if the tree will be able to recover from the flood and to give fruits, we don't know that. We don't know how long it will be until the economy will be able to recover and give fruits again. But we know that there is hope and it's enough to give meaning to Noah's journey. And hopefully it's enough to give meaning to our journey as well. Thank you very much, Ayala. That was a wonderful, fascinating um, discussion. Um, I'm, gonna now I'm gonna now turn over to Jonathan to uh for the conversation thank you thank you dove and thank you ayelet for a, a really illuminating and challenging uh talk uh, just filled with uh thoughts to share with you um you I, I would say the theme of your talk is the therapeutic uses of literature and, and that reminds me as you've pointed out that you are yourself a clinical psychologist uh, as well as a novelist and i'm wondering what does your training and experience as a therapist bring to your experience of literature and your work as a writer? Um, wow, thanks, that's a good question. I, I think it's always about asking why is people the way they are? I think both literature and clinical psychology are driving from the same motivation, which is trying to understand the world, not just to judge people for what they're doing, but to try to understand why are people doing what they're doing? Why are they behaving the way they are? And, and I think when you look at these catastrophes, and in my novels, I sometimes put my, my characters, my protagonists, in their own private catastrophes or crisis or disasters. I think this is the moment when you really find the true character of a person is when he's dealing with a situation and suddenly you see something that perhaps until this very given moment, you won't know about the character. You wouldn't know about yourself, right? Until the moment you're facing a decision. I, I think Jonathan, we all have those moments in our life that we remember that we learned something about ourselves. We surprised ourselves with something that we did 
that we never thought that we would be capable of doing before. I think if you ask the raven before the flood, do you think you'll be such a coward? I don't think he'll say so. But then, you know, it brings you into this moment of choice and suddenly you learn something about yourself. And when I'm sitting in the clinic and, and somebody comes into the clinic to, to me as a therapist and says something like, something terrible happened yesterday. You know, the war started, something happened. In Israel, things always happen. And these terrible moments always confront people, not just with the external reality, but also with the way they choose to deal with external reality. Uh, if we're looking for mythic meanings in uh, corona, uh, the thought occurred to me that uh, plague has always been in history the opportunity to blame the other and to demonize the other. Uh, this is certainly something Jews have experienced. Uh, Jews were blamed for the Black Plague in Europe. And our own president, shockingly, uh, referred, uh, suggests that uh, COVID-19 is a Chinese virus. He calls it a foreign virus. Uh, and I'm wondering if, is that a meaning that you are concerned about, that people are experiencing this uh, global pandemic and using it as a, a, a way of blaming other people for their fate? I think it's a very, very important point that you're making here. And it's fascinating to see how, you know, we're talking right now, but there's an ocean between us, between the place I'm sitting and you're sitting. But when you give this example from the US, I think it's exactly what we see from the other side of the ocean here in Israel. We see people talking about the refugees from Eritrea in Tel Aviv as people who carry diseases. People talk about them in this rhetoric daily, but right now people are saying maybe the coronavirus will be stronger there because these people are not as clean as we are. So you see how fast we are. The moment we're facing a, a challenge or a crisis, how fast we are to turn our fear into hate. I'm always shocked by, by how easily it happens. How easily can fear be transformed into hate? It, it happens you know, in, in days. And we can also see it here between secular Jews and Orthodox Jews. Um, because we did have higher rates of coronavirus among the Orthodox communities here in Israel. Um, and that was an objective fact. But from this, it came so fast to saying those Orthodox Jews are not clean. And then we had more coronavirus in the Arab communities. And then you had people saying those Arabs, they're not clean. And those moments between objective fact into those leaps of stereotypes and hatred, I, I think it's amazing. And as you said, being Jews, we, we know these sentences, they echo. They echo in our minds, they echo in our hearts. But it doesn't make us immune to having the same sort of racism towards other. And I really think this is history's irony, right? Indeed. You know, over here in America, we've had experience with religious leaders, fundamentalist Christian leaders, who have, for example, famously blamed uh, the Katrina hurricane disaster on uh, tolerance of homosexuality in America, that we're being punished. And you've touched on the idea that God punishes sin. Uh, but I was very intrigued by the fact that you separated out the fate of Job. And I'm fascinated by the fact that in that story, Job is plagued by God himself, who has been urged by Satan to test Job's faith. Job is not a sinner, he's sinless. And Satan says, well, if you made him suffer, he would curse you. And that's the burden of that story. And it makes me wonder if you see, uh, again, speaking in the mythic meanings of coronavirus, that we're being tested in some way if not by God, perhaps by nature. And what, what you see as that test and how we pass that test, what constitutes passing that test? I, I think you're right that Job is the most, I think 
disturbing, one of the most disturbing stories in the Bible, because it doesn't have this very clear idea that if you have a plague, it means something went terribly wrong. Because you don't have this explanation that somebody committed a sin and then you have a plague. This is what's so disturbing about the story of Job. It doesn't fit the concept, the almost childish concept that we want to hold because I think kids really need stories to be this way. And this, this childish need in us to think that our father and mother are always right and that even if they punish us, they had a reason to. You know, working with kids of abusive families, Kids that were beaten would rather think of themselves as I was a bad kid and that's why my dad beat me up than to think my dad beat me up for nothing. That's far more scary than to think I was a, a bad kid and that's why I was beaten. And Job is, as you say, the, the anomaly. And I think that's why it's a story that people keep coming back to trying to figure out what's going on there. Where, where did Satan came from? But I think for, for me as a secular Jew, I find Job to be perhaps one of the biggest challenges to, our, to secular life. Because for me, it is, as you're saying about the virus, not about cursing God or about cursing those Eritreans, those Arabs, those Orthodox Jews, cursing the other, whoever the other is, but about trying to be put into the test and not to end up cursing God. And I'm saying God is the other because the ultimate test to your ability for, for grace or for compassion or to, to your humanity, the ultimate test would be, would you curse the, the other? And, and if you're not, then you can be part of something which is divine. And, and if you turn into this hatred so rapidly, I think it says something about who we are. That's the only place where I do link to the idea of it as a test. I don't think it's a test from God, but I do think it's a test. I think it's a test to our moral standards and to who we really are as a society, but also as individuals. You know, I've heard conversation about uh, how uh, clean the skies are uh, during the lockdown. People aren't driving, people aren't traveling, there are fewer planes in the sky. And it's almost the sense that uh, human beings are an affliction to the planet. We're the pestilence on the planet. And when we're confined, uh, the planet repairs itself, uh, which leads to the conclusion, at least for some people, that maybe the planet would be better off without us. Uh, do you think that that kind of despairing uh, negative conclusion is, is a risk of going through something as profound as the, as the global pandemic, that it leads to depression and fatalism? You know, it's really interesting because there's, I, I worked in a mental health hospital and I just talked with the head of my department there. And um, so I worked in a locked ward and I asked him, how are the patients doing right now? Do we see more suicidal patients now in the hospital than before? And I was sure he's going to say that the ratio of suicides attempts will go up. But he said, you know what, at least in, in this hospital, it actually went down because people are feeling that we're all on the same boat. Think about North boat. We're all in the same boat and we're together right now. That maybe it's because of something in the social connection in Israel. I do know that there are statistics of um, suicides upon wartime. Uh, that suicide percentage drop during wartime because when there's an external threat, people unite together to handle it. But then I think when you're asking about the risk, I'm thinking about um, Saramago's novel, Blindness, when he, he brings the plague of blindness upon people. And, and you see they're very beautifully put, the risk, but also the potential. So the first man goes blind, and then everybody else goes blind. And when the first man goes blind, you have this question of how will the others respond, right? That's the test. Will we be wolves or will we be humans? And then people respond by he goes blind and the, another person drives him home. So you're saying people are not hell, people are helping each other. He drives him home, but then he steals his car. And, and I think that's the risk. 
the risk of how quickly generosity turns into atrocity. But then the wife of another person in the novel, she, she's the only one who doesn't get blind. She's the only one who keeps on seeing. But she chooses to pretend to be blind in order to join her husband, who is blind, and to go with him to be isolated, where the, the authorities put all the blind people. And I think the risk is also the opportunity. It's the risk to find out that we're not willing to make any sacrifice for others and that we're full of hatred for others that just comes, jumps out of us the moment we're put in the test. But also the opportunity to find out something about ourselves and what we're capable of doing and, and giving to other people. Uh, to prepare for our conversation today, I had the pleasure of watching w the talk you gave at UC Santa Barbara uh, about your latest novel, The Liar, on University of California television. And I heard you say, as you have said in, our, in your talk today, that you are a secular Jew, not a religious Jew. And yet you said in, in the talk I heard this morning that you always open the Bible when you're uh, doing a writing project. And we can see for ourselves today how deeply steeped you are in the storytelling traditions and the, the, the um, symbolism of the Bible. Uh, but, it, but I'm intrigued by the fact that a secular person would uh, resort to the Bible for any purpose. What does the Bible mean to you as a writer and, and really as a moral person? What do you, what do you draw from it? Um. I, I think for me, it's interesting because here in Tel Aviv, it's, it's Shavuot evening. So it's uh, the eve of Shavuot, the uh, Chag Matan Torah. Um, I grew up in a secular family, but for me, I think the Bible is the, the most fundamental textbook for, for my work as a psychologist and for my work as an author. Because I think when you try to understand something about the DNA of the human soul, I think all what you need to know about the DNA of the human soul is, is in this book. And I think that's the reason why so many years after it was written, it keeps being relevant. So people can still open it up and find something which is relevant for our lives today. So when I look at my two little kids um, fighting over our, the love of a parent, and I think about Kind and Abel and about how when you fight over the love of, of a parent, the love of God, this fight can lead you into, you know, into killing your brother. It makes me treat my kids just a little bit differently because I know there's a story about that. And I feel those stories are far more violent, hopefully, than my own life. But in a way, these stories are my own life. They are the archetype, like every good mythology, I think, is the archetype of the life that we're living today. And I think for all of us, what's so amazing about reading the Bible is that, you know, these, when, when you read the story of Job, these are people that didn't have in their room nothing from what you have in your room right now, right? Different clothing, no computers, no, no, no books as we know them today, nothing as we know it today. But then again, when we read it, it feels like they know the agony that we're going through right now. And when Job asks, why is this happening? We, we all know this moment when we ask, why is this happening? And I think part of being Jewish and being Israeli is trying to go back to our history and to open this book and not to treat it as something sacred in an orthodox way, but to treat it as something that, you know, can be useful, you know, like water are useful, something that you use on a daily basis to, to nurture yourself, but also to, to fight with and, and to discuss with. And I think the more you fight with it, the more, the more it's real and, and the more it's important to you. Uh, I want to ask a question that's a little off topic, but not greatly off topic. Um, yeah. I, I was very impressed when I, on my first trip to Israel that I could watch American television programs uh, subtitled in Hebrew in my hotel room. Uh, which I couldn't do in Rome, which was the, pre the city I was in previously. Um, and I'm also intrigued that you are yourself a screenwriter as well as a novelist. Um, and here's my question. Only a few years ago, it was remarkable to see an Israeli television show like Beit Tipul, 
reimagined as in treatment on American television and Hatufim as homeland. Uh, but nowadays we can actually watch a lot of Israeli movies and, and TV shows in Hebrew with English subtitles. Uh, Shtisel, for example, is, just, is nothing less than a sensation nowadays. And here's my question. Do you welcome this trend? Or do you think there's a risk in having Israeli writers and producers calculating how their work in Israel will play in America? I think if you're busy calculating how your work will play in Israel or in America, then you're doing something wrong. But you have this risk also when you're writing for your own audience. I remember my editor once told me that. He read a paragraph that he didn't like. And he said, you know why I don't like this paragraph? And I said, why? And he said, because you wrote it, but while you were writing it, you were looking behind to see if the reader likes what you're writing. And it feels like you've been writing it, looking behind your back, and, and looking for the attention of the critics or the audience or to, for the approval of your mother or your grandmother, but you weren't looking at the page. You weren't looking at the novel. You were looking behind to see the responses instead of being inside what you're supposed to be writing. So this thing that he told me, which really upset me at first, but it was very important for me later on when I kept on writing. I think this risk is always there when you sit down to write. The risk that instead of asking what's the most important thing in the story, you will ask yourself what's the most important thing to sell books or to sell TV shows or, or to sell cinema to, to the US. I think every author and every artist is dealing with this question daily. Um, and so I'm not scared specifically about the, the US market. I am scared about the ability that people will write things different or do TV shows different because they want to get to the wider audience as possible and they will Photoshop the truth, you know, just for it to be more uh, commercial. But when you look at Stiesel and Fauda, I don't think they did it. I think that's what's so beautiful about Stiesel is that they, they, there's something so delicate and so non-commercial about it. And it worked because people are, people are not idiots. When they see a good drama with, with delicacy, they go for it. Ayala, I want to thank you for the honor of uh, engaging in conversation with you in public. And I'm going to pass along the microphone to Dove for additional questions from the audience. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you again, Ayala. Exactly. That was a really fascinating conversation, very thought-provoking. Uh, we have been receiving quite a lot of questions from our audience, and the audience, by the way, is all over the world. So uh, this is one of the great benefits of, of uh, doing this uh, event like this online and giving the opportunity for people all around the world to hear your insights into literature and human nature, and um, I'm, I'm personally very grateful for that. So I'm going to just try and uh, read a few questions and maybe... Uh, put the few uh, the questions together that we've been that we've been uh, receiving. A number of the questions have concerned what you talked about uh, in the way in which people, in trying to make meaning out of catastrophe, uh, look to understand it as a response to as a result of sin. As a, and, um, and there's this desire based upon biblical readings to connect catastrophes to uh, to the ways in which we've we've failed. Um, is that is that that same tendency, and we've seen um, coming up becomes very problematic when it leads people to blame others for their own misfortunes, um, and when there where in our various catastrophes are occurring, the attempt to kind of attribute it to sin. So, for example, one of the questions uh, referred to the the ways in which uh, people who had HIV uh, were. Uh, blamed as homosexuals who were responsible for their for their own sin or we've also heard uh, um, people talk about the holocaust as being a response to uh, sins so um, is this a, a, a problematic tendency is it something that we is particular people have, does it does it reside in all of us is it um, in your view something that is more typical of certain types of people or personalities to find the need to to attribute meaning and catastrophe and to, to, to find in its sin? 
And I, I just as an add on to that, somebody asked, what would it what would it look like if we didn't do that? If we if we tried instead, um, as um, say Buddhism suggests, uh, to see our uh, to ex- to accept the fact that we have no control over our lives, right? To to accept the kind of meaning uh, that 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 instead of looking to attribute catastrophe to individual or collective sin instead we don't try to find an explanation for it as people have suggested about the holocaust that it defies explanation and therefore we have to just try how would we is that is that even possible um that's a great question and and i will say that the the later part about buddhistic or about i think that would be Camille's answer or jean paul salter's answer Um, and also victor frankel was very much affected by the two of them um, when he writes about the Holocaust, he, he would say exactly that. He, he would say the real challenge is to deal with the absurd and to deal with the chaos and to take it as a test, but not a test from God, not a punishment from God, but as a test to your own humanity and to your ability to find a meaning in a situation that lacks any meaning. And that's exactly the opposite than to say, I found a meaning because it was given by God because God hates. And then you f- miss, you know, you fill in the, the blank of who God hates right now. It could be the Jews and, and the next day it's somebody else. And I think it's a very interesting question of, can we just stop doing that? Or is it a template that we have in our mind mm. that we can't really, I, Nietzsche talks about it quite a lot, the, the idea that, that's why for me it was so fascinating to see how people started looking, at, as he said, about the Chinese virus or about, because you're saying these are secular people that didn't brought, they weren't brought up with the concept of a plague is a punishment for sin. But it's as if, you know, just like we, we are manufactured in a certain way, we may not like the fact that we're manufactured this way, but that's just the way we built. Perhaps you could say that this search for someone to blame is something that we have, like people need to go to the toilets once a day. It's stinky, but they have to go once a day. That's the way we're built. Perhaps also the way that we have to blame somebody else for our suffering. It stinks, but that's the way we're built. But now the question is, okay, that's the way you're built, but what are you going to do with it? Are you going to do with it in the living room? Or are you going to search for a place where, where you don't shove it in somebody else's face? And, and I think this is, our responsibility to identify these tendencies, to identify the inner racist inside us, to acknowledge the fact that we have an inner racist inside us, all of us, and to say, I understand that this is happening. This is part of of the way humans are built. And my challenge right now is to try to cope with it differently. And I might fail this challenge, but then again, you know, life will give me the same challenge tomorrow morning and, and maybe I'll treat it better then. You think um, if we regard kind of catastrophe as this kind of test, both as a test as a, of us as individuals and our character, but also a, as a social test of how societies respond, I wonder um, how, you, from the perspective so far, how you see uh, both Israeli society and American society uh, responding to this test. I mean, uh, re- you might say that in many ways, um, one of the most remarkable things that's come about in the, in the societal response is the decision of secular people who don't necessarily find meaning in this catastrophe to nevertheless decide to um, stay indoors, to limit their contact with others, to accept huge economic costs and consequences in order to protect the lives of those who may be more vulnerable. And that, in other words, there is in this something of the, that, that, that the, the kind of humanism at the heart of us that we've often, um, you know, see secular societies as spiritual, as, as empty, as meaningless, as not able to kind of rise to these challenges. We don't have the uh, spiritual or moral resources, but maybe we might actually draw some hope or inspiration by the decisions of individual, that individuals and families that may actually to stay indoors, to accept all sorts of hardships in order to protect people and in order to save human life. Do you think that's, um, do, you, 
do you do you see in the in the reaction of of Israeli society that um, that, that those kind of positive aspects, or do you think in fact what we're seeing is more the apportioning of blame, the scapegoating, the otherizing, if you like? I, I think what's really interesting about this time, and, and it relates to this this it's a good question, is the idea that you know all colors are more extreme right now. So if you see the hatred and the racism, it goes like this. But then again, if you look at moments of compassion and grace, they're also in a bay, to a bigger extent. Um, but I think we should differentiate between real acts of grace and between sometimes it feels like, you know, it's a, like in YouTube and you want to get the more people to, I had a friend, a doctor working in the hospital and I asked, how do you feel with people going up to their balconies and clapping? I don't know, you have it in the U.S. where people clap for the... In New York. And he said, at first, I was really moved. At first, I cried when, when I saw it because it's, it was so moving that everybody stopped everything to go out and cheer. But then I thought, will you be there the next day when we will have to fight for medical uh, treatment to everybody? Will you be there when the plague is over and we will fight for um, good conditions for, for the interns? It's, it's a fight here when doctors are not um, paid enough and people don't, we in a, as a society, we don't put enough into the, the health budget, which I think is something that you know in America. And, and he said, if it's just about clapping so we can all look at it together in the news and feel good about ourselves, then this is a uh, kitsch. It's sentimental. It, it doesn't carry any real responsibility. Everyone can clap their hands. So I think we should ask ourselves, are we really doing something or are we doing something that we look good when, when we take a picture, when we take a picture of it? And I think it comes back to talking about novels and about catastrophes. I'm thinking about um, A Tale of Two Cities, is it called in English? Ben Shtearim of Charles Dickens. Mm -hmm. So he has this opening lines, which everybody quote. It was the best of all times. It was the worst of all times. And, and it was a time of despair. It was a times of hope. I, I don't know the English word. But he ends it up with a sentence, very ironic sentence, when he says, by the end of this quote, he says, in short, this period resembled any other period so much that people could only talk about it in a way of exaggerating. And I think... We talk about COVID and this time tells us something about the human nature. But if we want to know something about the human nature, then as I said, you, you can open the Bible or you can open your window and you will look outside and you see how people can do the most terrible things to other people. And then again, how people can do the most wonderful, compassionate things to other people. And at any time, I think this is what being a human being is, is all about, right? The, the ability to choose and the question of what will we choose to do. So we have a question. Thank you. We have a question from Vered Weiss, um, who is um, at the Department of Jewish Studies at San Francisco State University, asking um, about the responsibility of the bystander, um, and, and particularly in, in times of, of catastrophe, the need to balance self-preservation and therefore maybe to withdraw or to, or to even to deny with the urge to help others. Um, and, and, and where, I mean, so, it, so she asks, can you consider responsibility in Boccaccio's De Cameron, where the group escapes the city and mm -hmm. entertains each other with stories, or in the Book of Job, where the friends encourage him to curse God and die? So what, what responsibility, how do we balance these responsibilities on the one hand to be, a, to, to help and to, but uh, to, to support, and on the other hand, the need to, for self-preservation to, to go away. And maybe on a, related to this, we had the question about going back to the story of Noah. Um, and on the one hand, you said, you know, we can see this as the, the need to be together. Um, on the other hand, one of the questions asked, but Noah left humanity, right? Noah mm -hmm. left humanity, save himself and his family, but, left humanity. So again, it points to this tension between individual, maybe from family preservation and our responsibility toward others. Uh, two great questions. Um, so first, thank you to Ver Advice for um, mentioning Bukacha. I actually thought about putting this one in, so thank you for putting it into the conversation. I think it's one 
more excellent example of how this question of how does the human um, character is, is revealed throughout the plague. And you see how in, in generations and in centuries, we have this, this question, where you put people in one room, what will happen? Will they kill one another? Or will they be able to form something better? We can think about Lord of the Flies as, as another example for, for this one question. And I think when you come to that, you, you always see that, do we really care and how much are we willing to, to what extent are we willing to hurt our own uh, quiet, nice surrounding in order to help the other? The, the question of the bystander, when I think about for instance, I don't know if you heard about it, but the Israeli Mossad, when we thought that we don't have enough medical ventilators, the Israeli Mossad somehow got uh, to Israel more medical ventilators and people were very happy and excited about it. And then the New York Times wrote a piece about how did the Mossad get this? And they sort of confessed that they, I don't know if, if they stole it or if they bought it from somebody in a country that would rather sell for money equipment that they really, really need for their own people. And then you ask yourself, how much do I as Israeli care if the Mossad did something like that to get me medical ventilators? Um, do I care enough not to use them and to say, please send them back to the people, I don't know, in Africa that need them just as much as we do? Or do I say, I don't like it, but I benefit from it, so I will be a bystander, or maybe I will be even worse than a bystander, I will be a hypocrite. I will criticize the Mossad for doing that, but I will still enjoy the fruits of the, the medical ventilators that we right now have in Israel. And, and if my grandmother or my dad will have to go to the hospital, they can use them. So I think the question of, of responsibility is one that, that we're facing daily and and you see it you'll see it soon with business closing up when, when the restaurant needs you or the person who took care of your kids or or people that you know are getting out of job when you say oh, i'm so sorry it's such a difficult time and then we go to plan on our next family vacation or are we willing to really um i don't know pay a price to to help other people who got hit worse than we did. I, I think it's, it's a big question here. So um, I have a question about uh, the role of the novelist, the writer in, in a time like this. Um, you know, you've spoken of the, the need for humans to find meaning in catastrophe and to draw out meaning and to, uh, to make sense of it, whether it's to understand it in terms of sin or responsibility or the possibility of renewal. And for secular people, we don't have rabbis or priests necessarily to turn to, to help us do that. Do you think novelists, writers such as yourself have a particular responsibility therefore in a time like this to help to provide that meaning or to give that possibility, to make sense or to provide a narrative, if you like, in, the, in these moments, particularly for secular people who don't necessarily know or don't have other sources uh, to turn to? I, I don't think of myself as a priest or a rabbi. Um, I, think, I think in times like this, when we open a book, um, we do ask if we're not into a getaway, if we're not into, I'll just read a book or I just go into Netflix and forget. But if we open a book, which is not a getaway, which is a journey into meaning, then I think, yes, I, I go into novels when I read them again, because I feel that maybe they can tell me something about what's going on in my life right now that I don't see or that I don't understand. So I turn to novels in order to do that. But I also think about this very intimate relationship between a novelist and a reader. I'm thinking about what we're doing right now, which is, for me, it's, I, I, I couldn't think it was possible to be sitting and talking with people in Los Angeles in the eve of Shavuot about Jewish mythology, about literature, and, and we have people from all over the world. And it's, it's a difficult thing to do, to sit in front of a computer and, and talk to someone, but we're all doing this together because we're trying to form a, a community or to, to have some sort of meaning, which is, I think, we talked about what humans do in times of crisis and how we have this template of hate, of blaming something, somebody. But we also have this template of try to form a narrative, 
try to have a story that we can all share together. During the plague, you don't see a group of, of donkeys or, or you know, a group of animals um, or a pack of wolves sitting together and trying to understand what's going on, why are we dying, what is the meaning of all of this. This is something that humans do, and this is something that we do together. I think as long as you have readers, as long as you have communities of, of people thinking together, doing something together, then in a way you're, you're trying to deal with this test. You're trying to do something together rather than say, I'm self-isolating, I'm running into you know, junk food and, and Netflix, and, and that's it. I don't want to think about everything, just call me when it's over. What about, uh, one of the questions asked, um, what about those people who do find uh, the retreat from the world, the retreat from others, you know, maybe what Sartre is referring to as, you know, hell is other people, that they find that calming, that for them, actually the removal from society um, or, or, or being, or solitude can be calming. Is that, how do we, what about those people? I mean, is that somehow against human nature or there are different types of people? And um, it's interesting because I'm thinking about the, the mental health hospital I worked with and, and the head of the department I had a discussion with. And he told me that when you talk about people coming from um, abusive families, from sexual abusive families or from very violent families, in this case, for people like this, the fact that when they're in the hospital right now, you don't have any visits. Families cannot come to visit now in the hospital. Well, now they can, but until two weeks ago, there were no visits. And it's very sad to say, but for some patients, not to get any visit is the, the best thing that happened to them. And I think in this case, as you see that Sartre was right, and hell can be other people. It can be a person who, who is abu so abusive towards his children that the meetings with him shake their world so much that, that yes, isolation would be better. And I also think that maybe it's, in a way, you know, we have those waves inside ourselves of moments when we need to be alone and we cherish the fact that we are alone and that we can breathe a little bit and think a little bit. And between moments when we're saying, I, I had enough of that, I want to open the window and to open the door and, and to meet other people. And, and I think as long as you can dance with it, you know, as long as you can move with it, then, then it's mental health. Whenever you're stuck, in one side, it could be, I don't want to ever see people, that's a problem. But I think also people who cannot bear one moment by themselves, that from the first day, it was impossible to tolerate one moment of being quiet with myself. I also think it's, it tells us something about who we are right now, and our capacity to, to be alone. Thank you. Well, um, thank you for sharing those wonderful psychological and literary insights with us. Um, I know we've, from the, 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 the huge audience that we've had watching this, that many people have really uh, found a lot of meaning in your, in your work and in your novels. A um, couple of questions is finally wanted to know when The Liar will come out in paperback and uh, what, your <laughs> next, uh, what your next novel will be. What, when, when can they expect the next one? Perhaps you don't want to give them that, but those, those are the questions that have been coming in from people eager for you, I guess, to continue to offer your insights and wisdom to the world. Um, so, so first, thank you for the questions. And, and I'm sorry that I can't answer all, all the questions that, that came in through, through the chat. Um, I have no idea when Delara is coming out in paperback. I was supposed to be in the U.S. for a reading tour, but I'm in Tel Aviv for a reading tour right now. Um, and the next novel, I was supposed to finish it, but I have two kids at home for the last three months. And I think to write a novel when you have two little kids at home is if you're talking about tests, that one test that I completely failed. <laughs> I understand that all too well. Well, I would say on behalf of the Nazarian Center, when your novel does come out in paperback, we would be only too happy to host you uh, at UCLA, hopefully in person in the future. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Ayelet, for a really wonderful illuminating and thought-provoking conversation and I want to thank uh, Jonathan as well for wonderful questions very stimulating conversation so um, yes that was really it was it was great we're really uh, 
very delighted that you could both join us today and that there's so many people around the world who could do so as well. I want to, uh, before ending, thank again our, our uh, co-sponsors for uh, this event, the UCLA Department of English, the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures, the Center for Near Eastern Studies and the Center for the Study of Religion, um, and the Jewish Book Council and Diesel, the bookstore in Brentwood, California. Um, for those of you who want to share this uh, program, and I would encourage you to do so, the entire program is available on the Nazarian Center's multimedia page, as well as on the Center's YouTube channel, so you can share the entire program with friends and family. And if you enjoyed this online event, I want to uh, encourage you to uh, view other events that we've had, other webinars that are available on our website, and join us again for more events in the future. Hopefully, we will be able to bring back Ayelet in the future, and Jonathan as well. And thank you both. That was really wonderful. And I want to wish everybody out there uh, good health and, uh, and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, and thank you so much for hosting me. Thank you.